Welcome to the Yellow Brick Therapy Podcast, episode number 13. I'm really excited to talk about ambiguous loss with Ellie, and this is a topic that whether you're a therapist or simply just a human, um, this topic applies to all of us. And we joke around a little bit in this podcast, but there's definitely some deep topics that we talk about as well. And this is definitely a topic that's dear to my own experience and growth and and the ways that I've conceptualized different experiences in my life and given myself permission to grieve things and understand what that it was even grief at all, Um, just because I didn't quite know what ambiguous loss was for myself. So anyway, to get into the meat of it, I'll go ahead and start the show. I hope you guys enjoy it. Also, shameless plug, I'm going to talk a little bit about Soma Recovery. We are a mental health facility that works on both the mind and body parts of mental health and trauma, and we also have a focus on eating disorders, and we treat all types of mental health issues as well, but I have to shout out for eating disorders because that's kind of my jam, and yeah, all right, let's go into the show. You ready? Yes, yes, let's do it. All right. Come on. All right, I am very excited to introduce you guys to Ellie Highland. She is another MFT like me who has a lot of experience with uh, grief Mm -hmm. and working with grief. And I think you could probably introduce yourself better than me, but we originally recorded a podcast a couple months ago, (laughs) and it was amazing. And I go to edit it, and all of the audio is just like, it was it was unfixable. Yeah. And that was really, really sad because it was such a good, like, the energy of it, everything was just amazing. Yeah, we were, like, so, on the flow. <laughs> we were in flow, for sure. So here we are again, attempting round two. And we're not going to try to make it the exact same, but we're just going to let it be what it is. Um, I think the topic itself is really fascinating and a thing that therapists don't always talk about with their clients or if maybe don't always recognize as Mm -hmm. grief. Yeah. Um, And so we're going to be talking about ambiguous loss today Mm -hmm. and all the different components around that. Yeah. Um, But yeah, first I, you know, we're going to go into our first four, but I'd like for you to also just kind of tell us where you're at because I know you've made some transitions career wise lately. So tell us more about what you're doing. Yeah. So, uh, when we originally recorded this podcast, I was, uh, working for the Wichita children's home as grief counselor. Mm -hmm. And so in that role, I was developing a program around ambiguous loss and everything. Um, and running, uh, the kids cope mending lives groups, uh, Mm -hmm. because as of July 1st of 2018, uh, Kids Cope went under the umbrella of the Wichita Children's Home in order to increase outreach, get more families, more volunteers and everything like that, and do more work in the community that way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but as of uh, recently, a uh, position became available in Wichita Children's Home to uh, be the mental health counselor, so working on site with the kids who are in our care um, to support them and their mental health needs and everything. And so um, I'm still like so in love with Kids Cope as a program and, you know, wish there was a way I could like manage to still be grief counselor in all those roles and everything like that. But, you know, it, you know, I got to just uh, make this transition and stuff. And I think I'm going to do some good stuff. And so, My program that I developed for ambiguous loss, I still get to do with the kids, like, to an extent and everything because it's their experience of the kids of the children's home anyway, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I ever, like, I just want to also note, my dog is here with us, and she's a very curious pup. Nora! We, if Mm -hmm. I'm ever kind of distracted or taking something away from her, that's what's going on. Hey! Hey, what you got right now anyway? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you know this podcast is real. This We're is not real. editing. We're in real time right now. Yeah. And yes. Nora, uh-uh. Leave it. <laughs> she knows that command, but sometimes I think when we're not Come paying here. full attention to her, she Let's likes love. To, Let's yeah, love, baby. She likes to catch our attention. Yeah. Which is understandable. Yes. Yeah. Good babe. But that's really cool in that you were able to create that curriculum and you're still a part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think regardless, like, you still just have such a good, like, knowledge base of that and a passion. Like, you're going to be bringing that to whatever work 
yeah. that you do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So spending a lot of time in that research was just, like, cha- changed a lot of how I do therapy and things like that. So. Yeah. Oh, that's really great. hmm And so we're going to go into our first four. Okay. Maybe. Hold on if I pull them up. Yeah, you know. Yeah. All that good stuff. Where did I put it? I might have to minimize some windows. Alrighty, so what did you want to be when you grew up, like originally, when you were a little kid, um, and how did that evolve to you being in the position you are today? Yeah, I remember answering yeah, I was this like, question. Now I remember your answer, yeah. yeah. No, because uh, like in fourth grade, uh, someone on the playground was talking to me about, uh, you know, their boyfriend or whatever, you know problems they were having and like I gave advice and they're like you should be a psychiatrist and stuff and I was like fuck yeah I should be a psychiatrist and (laughs) so just went with that uh all the way through knew that I wanted to be a therapist of some sort and everything like that so um explored a couple different options and everything but MFT just really made the most sense to me because we are a product of the people that we're around and we need to build healthy relationships in order to engage in our world and ourselves in a productive way and stuff. Yeah. And so it just made sense it to me. It kind of fit for what you were looking for. Yeah, and it's just stupid that I figured that out in fourth grade. Well, stupid or amazing. Like, I think I mean, that's yeah. cool that, like, you literally had this childhood dream or, like, idea that was able – that you were able to actually bring to fruition because I think mm-hmm. a lot of us, like, we have a, a certain idea of what we want to do or be, and then it's, like – life happens in so many different ways and you know to have that wisdom from like that young like I knew since I was about 16 that I wanted to do therapy yeah I remember feeling weird for that Mm -hmm. but then you told me that story and I'm like okay cool yeah we're on the same page (laughs) knew before college even or you know other different experiences so yeah that's really cool Mm mm-hmm and what has been one of your, what I call, like, your worst, or to reframe that, as most a most learning moment in therapy, where you were kind of in therapy, and, like, things happened, and reflecting back on it, you kind of, you learned from that experience to maybe what you would do in the future, or what you wouldn't do in the future? Um, like, as I'm treating somebody? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, You're like in my therapy? Yeah, like in my life or like in other people's lives. Um, You know, I think one of my hardest ones that I've had was, uh, you know, not really tuning in fully to a client uh, when they were going through some relationship issues and stuff and I allowed them to come in for some couples therapy and everything and trying to meet them both where they're at and everything and not really recognizing that in this particular couple, she wasn't invested at all anymore and trying to strive to create a relationship for them to, or some kind of point of connection for them when like it was, it was prolonging what was inevitable and like that they were going to split up and things like that. And not, my not being accepting of that because of course you know like the purpose of couples therapy is to try to rebuild relationship and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and I should have recognized more the inevitability of things and it kind of helped them as a couple transition more that way rather than working them into a hole right yeah and I think it can be our natural Cool as humans to want to create that connection mm-hmm. and to keep relationships together yeah. for the most part. And so, and it's, it's a tough job to actually be able to be present and let people be kind of where they are mm-hmm. in, in the uncoupling process, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, I think it is our, it's kind of like, at least for me, I'll speak for myself. I won't yeah. speak for everybody <laughs> else, but for me, I know that too. Like, I have to be careful that I'm not overly trying to make them work on their stuff and really be in that crucible mm-hmm. versus it, when they're not ready or willing or able to yeah. be in that because there are opportunities for couples to grow. And I think, you know, understanding in life, even for myself, like, maybe it's not their time. And yeah. And I can't push that. Yeah. Yeah. So... 
Mm-hmm. It's definitely relatable. Yeah, yeah, that's that's just a hard part for like anybody in any situation. You can't force people to be in a place that they can't exist in right. and everything. So I, I think it was just like in my period of working in therapy at that time, it was like my own striving was projected into that experience and stuff. And so. Right, and yeah. that awareness you had of that is amazing, that self as a therapist, mm-hmm. right? Yep. <laughs> uh, all those things Dr. Rathbun taught me. <laughs> yes, but that's so good. I mean, I think, to me, that, that builds my trust in you as a therapist when you're able to say, like, I had a moment where I was like, this is really more about my stuff being in this mm-hmm. session than yeah. you know, being able to really kind of be a space for these people and their right. stuff, you yeah. know? Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and we all, as therapists, will go through those. those oh, yeah. No, we all slip up. Different, yeah, different sessions and different issues and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. So now I kind of want you to brag on yourself a little bit. What's some of yeah. your best moments in therapy where you're like, yes, this is why I do what I do? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Heck yes. Okay. So let me think on that one. Um there was one time I was working with <clears throat> a woman who had a, uh, she was going through, uh, we were discussing her previous relationship and the things that went on in that relationship and stuff. And, you know, the words of whatever was said, I can't remember, but there was, in our discussion we were having, I said something and she actually just paused and was like, I think that was the most insightful thing I've ever fucking heard. And we both sat there for a second and was like, damn, that's a truth bomb. Like we, we have to like, just like let that settle and like orient around it and everything because whatever it was, um, you know, it had an impact for both of us and we were able to connect in our Mm -hmm. therapeutic alliance Mm -hmm. on what was said and everything. And, you know, that's all about, you know, my being able to have good rapport with her, but then also like being able to grow, show her how you can grow in connection through having insight and understanding yourself and looking at this deeper level kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And having her trust in that process, too. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. And that's awesome that you guys were able to both be in that moment to And just be like, there. oh, damn. Yeah, <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. That is awesome. Do you remember what it was? Or is it kind of like at this point you're like, eh. It, it, it was a while ago now. <laughs> and so it's just like, and, you know, like even at... After I said it, like, even, like, days later, I was like, I don't even know what I said, but I just know that was a really good moment. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like I've had some of my, like, when I'm working with clients, sometimes I explain things, and I feel like I'm talking to them, but also myself. Mm-hmm. You know, like, it's a weird moment where I'm like, oh, that just. I really needed to hear that, that too. me, too, like. Mm, there's mm-hmm. something about that but it's like a it's kind of it's a cool moment um it's a cool moment in therapy when your clients have those aha moments and then it's also healing for you yeah. at the same time as they're connecting those dots like, yeah you're like ooh, this is good stuff yeah mutual therapy this is why we do that yeah exactly <laughs> I'm like it doesn't it doesn't happen like all the time but yeah when it does happen it's like i should pay really, myself <laughs> it's a real cool moment yeah, yeah. it's really cool it's very yeah. cool and the last one is, what is your spirit animal? Oh, yes. My <laughs> spirit animal is an orca whale. Orca. Orca whales. Yeah. Tell us more why that is. Um, so I like orcas because, um, I, you know, they're beautiful. And, like, they're majestic and everything like that. But, like, they'll also fuck you up <laughs> pretty bad. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very analytical. They're very strategic in how they uh, capture their prey and everything like that. And also they work in a pod. So mm-hmm. it's, like, they're not operating independently and everything. They have a community mm-hmm. and stuff. And I feel like in my personal work and everything, and a lot of it happened when I was doing my sand tray therapy training, because I kept on, like, picking an orca to describe myself and everything. And then I got to the realization, like, oh, shit. Like, I got to find my pod and everything like that. I got my pod now and stuff. But, um, yeah, 
And also, I grew up watching Free Willy, and, like, that's the best movie ever. So, (laughs) you know, all the above. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. really cool. I love that. That's so unique. I wouldn't have, like, you know what I mean? I think sometimes people say, like, even my own spirit animal, I'm like, I'm a dog. But, like, (laughs) you know, it's like, what? I mean, my other spirit animal is a corgi. corgi. (laughs) You know, I'm just like, I'm happy, and I'm cute. I can totally see that. We we have both bonded over our puppers. Yeah. Yeah, and they're good friends, too. Yeah. Good to <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. hmm And so let's go right into the meat of ambiguous loss. Let's talk more about that. So yeah. can you describe for us what that is um, and how it's different from other grief and loss yeah. experiences? Yeah. So when we think of grief and loss, we think of death. Oftentimes, and it's the the process of having to uh, develop a ritual around somebody's death, and whether or not you're able to anticipate it or anything, and uh, you know, build the funeral, find closure, and be able to connect with others around not having that person in your life anymore in a very physical, real way. Yeah. So ambiguous loss is pretty much the opposite of that ambiguous loss is losing somebody um either physically or emotionally but that person is still living so when we lose somebody physically and they're still alive um that's like uh launching a child uh into adulthood and everything or uh otherwise people moving away or something like that, not being able to engage in a relationship with that person physically the way that you would like to. Mm -hmm. We see this a lot with uh, divorce, too, uh, because one parent has to move out of the house, and so, like, the child suffers ambiguous loss when, like, you know, I'm home from school and I want to watch a movie, but I can't watch my movie with mom tonight Mm -hmm. because mom can't be here. Right. And so that's a loss experience that we're not acknowledging all the time. Yes. Um, when we lose somebody emotionally, then uh, that means that this person is still here, very physically present in our lives, but we're not able to have that emotional connection with them anymore. Mm-hmm. This happens when, um, you know, someone suffers a traumatic brain injury. And so they're not able to cognitively process everything that they need to anymore. Um, Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. uh, and severe mental illness. Otherwise, an addiction Mm -hmm. is a really tough one. Uh, And we see that a lot with our kids. You know, they're not able to connect with their parents when they're in their addiction. Um, because that person is very there. That person is on the couch. They're in the room and everything, but you cannot connect with them at all emotionally because they are wrapped up in their other things um, and not able to have an emotional connection with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think it's good that we're acknowledging, you know, the parents that are struggling with addiction or other people that are struggling with addiction and seeing Mm -hmm. that emotional loss because I don't think people even think about grieving or Mm -hmm. the grieving process around that. Yeah. I've also, like, a lot of my own, like, clients and people I've known, too, where they've talked about experiences of just not being emotionally connected to their parents for Mm -hmm. one reason or another. I imagine that might apply, too, like, where their parents are working all the time. Oh, yeah, workaholics. Workaholics. Okay, yeah, yeah, because let's talk about that one, too, because I feel like that is, like, so, especially, (laughs) I'm I'm not trying to stereotype, but... I've seen it a lot for dads. Yeah. Like where they're out of the home or well, away with, like, the military, right? Like, mm-hmm. we're in a – in Wichita, we have a mm-hmm. military base, so we think about military families and or Air Force base. Um, yeah. Yeah. We so, think about that. Yeah, because how ambiguous loss was actually coined um, and everything, it was – Uh, a term developed by Pauline Boss and she actually observed it she uh, was a pupil of Whitaker actually and so like I'm so in with any once I read that I was like I'm sold we're good Um, but uh, she uh, was doing family therapy and stuff and she noticed the emotional detachment that 
fathers have to their children. Mm -hmm. And that's where she kind of grew out of it and everything and developed ambiguous laws was because of that observed father emotional disconnection because he's out working and um, providing for the family and therefore not able to emotionally connect with the kids and Mm -hmm. stuff. And so that came out in family therapy. She saw it. She was able to develop theories and everything around it. And boom, ambiguous loss was born. Mm -hmm. So absolutely workaholicism is like the basis of ambiguous loss as a term. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Well, can you tell us more about Um, what drew you into learning about ambiguous loss and why this might be important for other therapists to know? Yeah, so I liked ambiguous loss because, you know, death loss as an experience is probably the most universal uh, as, like, a very tangible thing. Like, everybody's going to die. And so as long as we're in relationships with people, we're always going to experience grief from a death loss. Mm -hmm. Um, But ambiguous loss is just as universal, but the least talked about. Mm -hmm. So because everything around grief has has so much to do with uh, loss. And we think of death. We think of, like, people who are... uh, have severe illnesses and everything like that that are going to end their lives. And so we can have anticipatory grief and everything, too. Um, and so we we have a good understanding of that. But it's the ambiguous loss uh, that keeps us from being able to continue to engage in the relationships that we can have mm-hmm. and everything. Yeah. So um, I really wanted to learn about it because of how it affects our kids. And, you know, of, of course, kids grow up and become adults. And, like, if that ambiguous loss is not addressed properly, just like anything else, any other kind of trauma, it will hinder their ability to connect as adults. Right. So I really wanted to learn about it so that I could address it um, for the kids that we serve at the children's home and everything, develop that program and stuff because, of course, those kids uh, have suffered so much other trauma and everything. And a lot of it has to do with ambiguous loss. Like, they're pulled from their homes, so they have that physical ambiguous loss. Like, my mom still lives at home, and I am here Mm -hmm. and everything, and I can't be there with her even though we have shit going on. I love my mom Mm -hmm. and everything, but I can't be with her. But then also the ambiguous loss of, like, mom's also an addict. Mm -hmm. And, like, I can't even when I'm home have an emotional connection with her. Right. But just because we can't be there with our people however we want to does not mean we still love them or do not still love them. Words, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, But, uh, you know, the idea is that we can still develop healthy boundaries and relationship with that person Mm -hmm. if we acknowledge some of these things. Yes. And go through the work. Yes. Yeah. I I love all that you're saying because you're right. I think a lot of people are acknowledging these as losses. And so they're not, and not only like people like the clients, but therapists like, yeah. aren't necessarily like seeing it mm-hmm. and when you start to view it through this lens of like that's a loss too and there's grief in that too it mm-hmm. kind of opens up a different way of looking at different experiences and mm-hmm. I found that like with myself and even my own clients you know if they've had a relationship with a parent like you were saying and mm-hmm. being vulnerable to say so I appreciate that mm-hmm. where like you for whatever reason can't emotionally or physically connect with them like there's you get to grieve that even if they're still alive right Mm because I think people don't understand that like there's anger and there's sadness and there's frustration and there's there's grief that comes up throughout time Mm -hmm. just like like other like death loss grief right where it's like okay they're not you know here the way I need them to be for this event or that event or I really needed a mom who could emotionally provide this for me Mm -hmm. at this event and they couldn't yeah right? and you still get to be upset and grieve that right? yeah yeah and to acknowledge that like there is that natural grief of being like 
this is the thing I want in my life and need in my life, and I nece- I won't necessarily be able to get that, and how do I grieve that so I can process it? Mm-hmm. And like you said, be able to still be in relationship and love that person, mm-hmm. especially when it's the emotional grief stuff. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm so glad you shared that, and I think that just definitely illuminates a whole different it's, way of viewing therapy. And, oh, like, yeah. People. You know, like, it, it opens up, like, a million doors of just, like, Noticing how important it is to acknowledge grief and because the, I feel like that's a big thing people also try to ignore is like that person's gone. We just do away with that. We brush it under the rug and we move on with our lives. And some people don't want to acknowledge grief. Like in running my death loss groups, um, there are people who are just, we're fine now. We, we don't need to deal with this anymore we've moved on we've prayed and everything or however they've gotten through and stuff and it it doesn't need to be a problem anymore and it's like no you still get to hurt and everything and we get to go through this wheel and momentum of grief and everything um and it's in all of these experiences and it's in all of these relationships where we can't connect with the person the way that we want to so. And so that, that leads right into my next question, actually. Yes, which I did is, it. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's perfect. Like, I think, you know, inside therapy, we might be able to identify where they have ambiguous loss, but how would a person, like, listening to this podcast, how would they identify the ambiguous loss in their own life? With the phrase, I miss them. Mm. You know, like, when, even in, like, couple relationships and stuff, like, ambiguous loss can be on a really surface level where it's like I'm here at work today and my partner is at his work today too and you can have that ambiguous loss of not being able to have them in relationship in the way that you want to have them in that moment we have a physical ambiguous loss because like I'm sad that I can't have them with me right now kind of thing Mm -hmm. um And, of course, like, it doesn't have to be that simple, and we can just acknowledge, like, sometimes you just get to miss people and everything. Mm -hmm. But, like, when it's a pervasive experience where it's, like, I am chronically unable to connect with the person that I want to to the extent that I need to and Mm -hmm. everything, um, that would be ambiguous loss. So, you know, like, for example, the military example, like, in contrast to my and my partner being at work for the day, we'll come home at night and we'll be able to reconnect and everything like that. For a military spouse, she might be at home here thinking, like, I miss my husband and he's at work, but he is going to be at work for six months in a different country. When do I get to talk to them? Who knows? And everything like that. And that is ambiguous loss because that's a chronic experience and it's pervasive. Right. And then... I think, too, like, I mean, from my own experience, the way that I've identified some of mine is anger. Oh, like, yeah. Um, it was it was kind of funny because I had a friend of mine just describing, her, like, an experience they were having with their daughter. And, okay. like, you know, usually I'm a pretty, like, lucky-go-happy person. I support people and, like, celebrating their wins and, like, good things in their life. And it was, like, this moment where, like, I was listening to him talk about all the cool things he was doing with his daughter, and I felt angry. And I was like, mm-hmm. what was that? Mm-hmm. Like, what is that about? Mm-hmm. And once I got, like, to be able to kind of step away from myself and that feeling and, like, be observant and kind of be curious about it, I connected the dots that it was, like, my own, like, missing and wanting, like you said, the missing. Envy. Of wanting that thing in my life. Yeah, right? and envy. And not having it. And being like, I don't get to talk about these cool experiences that I – have at least with like my biological father and so it's like one of those things Mm -hmm. where um you know and I thought in at some point in my life I thought like I had already kind of grieved that and everything was done oh yeah I think that's an important (laughs) part to bring up too where it's like I had a good 14 year period of my life that I was like I'm done I've forgiven that I'm good Mm -hmm. and then it's it will still show up and rear its head in my relationships and like in other moments like that. And I, I'm trying to be vulnerable, vulnerable to hopefully help other people recognize this for themselves too, where it's like, yeah, but I still have those moments where I'm like, man, I Mm -hmm. wish I had that. Right. Yeah. And that's exactly it. Like that anger is like maybe resentment towards the person that you don't have in the way that you want to. And then envy of other people. Yeah. 
is absolutely it because, you know, I can teach and talk to the kids at the home about this kind of stuff. And they're like, well, you don't know you've never been in the system and stuff. And I was like, that is so true. I've I've never been in the system. Thank God, um, because the system is broken in so many ways. And at the same time, that doesn't mean that we don't have a shared experience. And like, I envy some of the things that those kids have had connection to because some of them have very intense loving relationships too it's just a matter of like you know where they're getting those from and everything you know um they can grow in connection with their staff and everything and being able to connect in very good ways that like you know i wish i had those kinds of connections as well and there can be there can be mutual envy and everything like that it's just a matter of like acknowledging that you can't have that the way that you want to and being able to work through it in a healthy way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and the ways that we, you know, work on our, on meeting our needs as adults. But like, mm-hmm. I think, you know, when you were talking about children earlier, I kept on thinking about not only is it like the trauma that, mm-hmm. you know, children will have and they'll stuff down because they don't identify that as grief or anything needing, like, worth grieving. Well, they can't even acknowledge their emotions because they're kids. Right, they have the kid brains, right? Yeah. And so, on top of that, like, they, yeah, I don't know, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, but like their kid the brains, childhood but like, experience of yeah. grief and, like, you know, the fact that, like, it's so hard to find services for kids anyway. Yeah. But, like, grief services for kids. Like, Kids Cope is the only thing in Wichita that acknowledges childhood grief as a, as as a, a system. Well, yeah. even my adults, like, I hear the phrase, and I don't know if you've heard this before. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you Okay. <laughs> it's that phrase, like, well, that happened when I was so young. It doesn't it matter. It doesn't, yes, it mm-hmm. doesn't impact me or matter anymore. Oh, no. I don't remember, so it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, hmm. The problem is your body keeps the score. You, you know, don't remember for a reason. But you, and there's re- times that you won't remember things that, and that's part of the trauma disassociation process. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, on top of like, because sometimes they'll be like, well, I was two years old. And I'm like, well, and even when you were little, little, that's so impactful based on what we know about attachment and brain development, like mm-hmm. that first two year period, critical mm-hmm. time period. Um, so it's just funny when people, well, not funny, but like, it's an interesting thing to me that like culturally, People We're so think, dismissive. Yeah, of children mm-hmm. and their grief and loss experiences. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when we look at ambiguous loss and, like, how, especially for kids in the system and everything, kids in general, though, how much they have to see and deal with the adult experience when adults won't deal with their own emotional baggage and things like that. And that's where ambiguous loss is, and that's where it grows from. Yeah. Like, when parents don't deal with their shit, it causes ambiguous loss for kids because parents will turn towards their jobs and addiction and divorce and um, not being present with the kids and meeting the kids' emotional needs or physical needs anyway. Um, When that doesn't happen, that fosters ambiguous loss, and that creates kids who are emotionally stunted, grow up to be emotionally stunted adults, and it's a cycle that repeats. Right, right. And I think that's so important that you chronologically explain that because I don't think people are connecting those dots especially mm-hmm. like it's funny because I I think I may have mentioned this in another podcast but the the number one advice that I give my parents when they're like what do I do for my kid like give me a book mm-hmm. or this or that and I'm like go to therapy work on your stuff yeah like, read a book yeah like, maybe you need to read a book to get some context or whatever and that's fine but like you I mean there are some books that I'm like everybody should read this <laughs> true and that might be part of their work process but yeah. essentially and whether it's therapy or yoga or a, re- a spiritual retreat like work on your stuff like work on you because mm-hmm. you probably don't realize you don't realize the stuff you have usually none of us do we have yeah. our blinders on mm-hmm. at least not fully and then you know once you're able to be within a space with somebody who's good working with you through that stuff you will be able to be a much better parent and be Mm -hmm. able to like you said um prevent more 
ambiguous loss. Yeah, prevent all that trauma and everything. And uh, again, sometimes it's not not really preventable. Like Alzheimer's and stuff, you can't really prevent like that kind of ambiguous loss and stuff. And that's just like where we need to turn towards that experience and find health and healing by acknowledging it. That's true. Accepting, right? Yeah. Well, and that's, I think, okay, so I was going to kind of fast forward into like the parent thing. Like when we're kids, we can't, we don't have the brain capacity to accept things very well necessarily mm-hmm. or like to be able to fully integrate that information right. and realize that it's not about us. Yeah. Um, but when we're adults, I think you're right. Part of that grieving process is like accepting. Cause like there are people even in my own life where like they may never emotionally come around. Mm-hmm. Right. Whether oh yeah. It's Alzheimer's or, you know, whatever it is. Right. Mm-hmm. They may never, emotionally come around and being able to accept that and like move and like meet our needs in a different way because we're adults now Mm -hmm. is really help like through relationship like you said like Mm -hmm. you even mentioned having your own pod and like oh yeah community for yourself yeah I'm sure that's part of your healing too well yeah that's that's part of the healing of the ambiguous loss experience too is like when you're not able to connect with the people that you want to you need to find people that you can connect to and I mean that's I think that's also I keep using the word universal but like we really we are social mammals and we need people and things connected to us to feel good and um you know if we are not able to thrive in a certain relationship in the way that we need to we need to seek a relationship that does serve a purpose so you know Yep. So true. And I, I don't know that everybody necessarily acknowledges that mm-hmm. for themselves. Yeah. So that kind of leads into my last question about this, which is yeah. what and what is the best type of healing or therapy practice, at least that we know of to this day, mm-hmm. um, for someone who has experienced ambiguous loss? Yeah. So, um, you know, read up on Pauline Boss and like her books that she's written about ambiguous loss because like she lays out like I think it's like eight steps if I remember right I haven't looked at my book in like a minute (laughs) and so I should have prepped before this and stuff but um she lays out uh eight steps on like trying to work through ambiguous loss that are you know obviously not steps like chronological or anything but like these eight different ideas and like they're pretty straightforward things. They're pretty normal, like anything else you would do to acknowledge any other kind of trauma or anything like that. But like focusing really in on like a level of acceptance and um, acknowledgement of your own experience and your emotions and validating yourself is like the biggest thing. Because when we invalidate our own grief experience, we're saying we are not allowed to feel this mm-hmm. and stuff. And and what happens with that? Well, when we don't allow ourselves to feel grief, we don't fully invest in any other emotion. Mm -hmm. And we tamper our ability to connect. And when we tamper our ability to to connect, we're going to (laughs) go downhill. And (laughs) (laughs) No, it's so true. It it is. And so, you know, if and as social beings, we need to have connection and everything. So, yeah. So we need to get good at grief is what you're saying. We do need to get good at grief. And we need to get good at acknowledging what can cause grief, you know. And, like, maybe, uh, you know, like, acknowledging that, like, I, for example, if I don't have the friendships that I want right now because, like, I have no one who's, like, my go-to for, um, you know, talking about the really scuba divery deep shit and whatever. Like, I need to be doing myself a service of seeking out a person like that and everything and being able to grow in a connection there and being able to find other supports and, like, holding on to the things of previous relationships that have been helpful and stuff and letting go of the things that don't serve my purpose. So, for example, if I'm in a relationship with an addict, being able to have my boundaries of, like, I can be with them during these certain times when they're sober, when, you know, they are able to uh, have some kind of superficial conversation with me because I still love them, I still want to engage with them, and I'm going to let go of the things that don't serve me. So when they're using and when they're asking me for money or anything like that, I can't be around them then. You know, that's a really good point because, yeah, you're right that the people in those types of relationships are constantly probably moving in and out of the space of grief while their loved ones struggling with 
with trying to go through recovery because I know Mm -hmm. that process usually isn't linear for anybody. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. man, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with the physical loss and everything, being able to communicate what your needs are. Like, if that person is still able to engage in an emotional relationship with you, you need to be able to have the capacity and vulnerability to let them know what your needs are and being able to negotiate what does that look like. So, for example, a kid who, um, you know, parents got divorced or something, it's on the parents' duty to, like, connect with the kid and be like, what do you need? When are you going to need me? You know, uh, how can I be there for you even though I can't be at home right now? When can we talk and things like that? And it's also, you know, a big part on the parents to co-parent and do that effectively and everything and being able to navigate relationships in order to meet child emotional needs because that's primary. Right. Like that, you know, we, you should have a whole nother podcast on divorce and oh all my that gosh, shit. Yeah. Well, when, you, when you literally, when you started talking about that, it was like a whole world of thoughts and like feelings <laughs> yeah. came up around that because, you know, yeah. co parenting, like, I mean, I've, I haven't had any kids. I'm not like in a relationship and been divorced or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I imagine there's like, yeah, you're right. We could do a whole podcast on that alone yeah yeah and the effect it has on kids and everything but um yeah it's being able to communicate what your needs are and discovering like there's still hope for me like my although I have this devastating loss not being able to connect with the person that I want to and everything Mm -hmm. there is still hope for me in being able to grow in this connection and grow from this experience to better understand myself be my best person and everything and, um, you know, doing well for myself. The biggest thing with ambiguous loss too, is that, um, there's no ritual for it. Like I've started seeing things and I kind of love it that people are having divorce ceremonies Mm -hmm. and Oh my God, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I've never heard of that. Oh, my God. I'm going to send you a video. It's beautiful. (laughs) Like, this couple was getting divorced, and they had, like, some teenage girls or something like that. And, like, Mm -hmm. they had a whole ceremony out in a meadow, and, like, they all got dressed up and everything. And it was, like, an anti-wedding, basically. Like, the girls together made this huge painting and stuff, and, like, the, the divorcing couple cut the painting in half and they each got half of it kind of thing and stuff and it it, it was beautiful if it, it, it fucking makes sense you know to like ritualize something like a a separation of a uh a, a relationship or something like that and so with ambiguous loss there is no ritual and so as much as we can to put a ritual around it or and show like this is what my life was previous to my understanding of what I'm going through and now I'm going through this experience and like being able to be healthy and separating like put a ritual to it for example in the program that I've developed for the kids and stuff you know we burn letters and like mm-hmm you know, this is where I was and everything. And that doesn't have to be who I am now. I can let go of that and like, let that just go into the air and everything like that and creating a space for them to transition from what that was and what that relationship was into a place where they can exist as a empowered individual who understands what they're going through and stuff. So Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's one of the bigger grief experiences that we need to acknowledge for ambiguous loss because there's a funeral for death loss and we can create a like pseudo funeral for our ambiguous loss. Like, you know, if you're launching your kid off to college and stuff, that's its own grief. What kind of ritual are you going to put around that and stuff? It doesn't have to necessarily be, like, a grandiose thing, but, like, what kind of tradition can occur, like, when that kid comes back for holidays and stuff where, and then they have to leave again and be gone from you? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what can we do to, like, honor that space that, like, now we're going to transition back into a grief experience where we're not going to be able to connect the way that we want to? That's so true. And even the ones where it's like you can have a a more of a ritual that's like in person or in 
time and space, but then, like, the burning of letters or something else for when, you know, the ambiguous loss is something you can't have that other person Mm -hmm. meet you in, right? Yeah, right. Um, So I think that's just so, such a beautiful concept of, like, being able to, you, because you're right, we do ritualize and have, like, a, something there and something tangible for the energy and the loss that we're feeling Mm -hmm. for other more, what we would call more tangible losses, but, Mm -hmm. like, those are just, those matter just as much yeah absolutely and you know it's the process of working through ambiguous loss like I said is not like a novel experience it's not like totally new concepts or anything like Mm -hmm. that it's being able to acknowledge what you go through uh, dealing with the ambivalence of like they're here but they're not here kind of thing and um empowering yourself building connections letting go and having boundaries and stuff and yeah put a ritual to it yeah just letting you um emotionally process that Mm -hmm. event and Mm -hmm. move through it yeah that's very powerful i love that so we're gonna go ahead and move into the last four last four four. you need like some music i know i'm like i need like city or something but (laughs) oh but then i would have to edit that stuff and i'm just gonna be real like i like the energy of just like you know, recording with yeah, people and not having let's to just go. make it to edit. Like, I maybe at some point in the future. But yeah, like, like when you get like real in a podcast and, and like stuff, and like you're like me. number one on iTunes. Jenny's podcast was right. so <laughs> Joe Rogan, watch out! Oh yeah, <laughs> he's been doing. He's like one of the like notoriously like amazing podcasters and been doing it for years. But anyway, yeah. Last four. Last what four. What is the one thing you wish you knew when you started? When I started doing therapy? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, or maybe even when you started your journey in, like, you know, undergrad, grad school, this whole therapeutic <sighs> transformational journey. <laughs> I wish I knew so much more. <laughs> right? I mean, I, th- I wish I knew just, like... I went into grad school with the anticipation, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to do my two years in Wichita, do school, I go back to Iowa, and, you know, hunky-dory, everything's going to be fine, it's it's academic, it's all academic and stuff. I wish I knew just how much personal work all of that was going to be, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, yeah. I didn't buy in, and nobody does, but I didn't buy into the whole transformative journey bullshit and stuff, yeah, but, like, oh, my God, <laughs> like, thank God I did the program and everything, because I'm so much better for it, I understand myself better, I know that I need to go to my own therapy and work through my stuff and acknowledge my emotions and everything like that, and, like, I wish I knew that I, like, wasn't. Right. You don't know what you don't know. And yeah. You know it, and then you're like, dang it. And then I it's like, it. oh, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it, but then it's, yeah, like you said, like, thank goodness, like, mm-hmm. we freaking did that because, yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't buy into it originally either. I just thought it was kind of a hokey way of saying, like, we're super uh, clinical. Yeah. We're... And I was like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm down with the super clinical. Yeah. Um, but then, as like we went through the program and had such good leadership in that like Mm -hmm. you're right there were so many moments where we had to ask ourselves hard questions Mm -hmm. I mean some people didn't I'm sure some people were able to kind of make it remove themselves from it but well but that just means that like they they didn't get out of it what they could have like now I'm just like when I want to do something I am like throw my whole body into it, like, baptize me in that shit kind of thing, (laughs) because it's, like, I want to get everything out of it now, because, like, I think the first year of the program, I tried to not, and I tried to resist that and exist in my space, like, I don't need to go there and stuff, and then I was, like, oh, damn it, (laughs) I have to actually do this now, I go all in, so. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. So, so true. Yeah. What is the best psych related book for people in the field or outside of the field oh this is funny (laughs) because um my brother and sister-in-law are about to have a baby Mm -hmm. and so I can't not be the therapist Mm sister-in-law and I can't not give them therapy books (laughs) (laughs) and like I I got them (laughs) I got them a normal thing on their registry too like something they asked for and stuff but it was like I, 
you know, I want to love this kid. And the way I know to do this right now is to, like, give the parents some books on, like, how to um, acknowledge some of these things that, you know, they're not asking for anything like that. And I'm not saying that they should. But, like, you know, if it ever comes up, those resources are there. Mm -hmm. So um, I gave them... The whole brainchild, mm -hmm. Dan Siegel. Dan Siegel. <laughs> Dan Siegel's up in the air. Yeah. Um, and then I got them raising an emotionally intelligent child, John Gottman, mm -hmm. because like I, that's probably the number one book as far as I'm concerned. So that, um, and then I got them uh, another John Gottman book, uh, "You and Me Plus Baby Makes Three, and that's about like coming back together and building intimacy after a baby's born and yeah. stuff. So, because, you know, the big thing is, like, you still have to operate as a couple and do love and take care of yourself and stuff, and that is what's going to make the kid do well. Yes. So. Yes. Yes. And I was listening to a podcast with Gottman on it earlier this week, and he was just talking about how, like, the first three years of having a baby is often the most stressful. Were you listening to Armchair Expert? No, I was listening to Relationship Alive. I don't oh, okay. know. I just randomly was looking through different, like, podcasts. I listened, so the funny part was I listened to this podcast, like, a long time ago, mm -hmm. and I was like, I want to freshen up my Gottman. So I just, yeah. like, I just, like, popped it in and, like, started listening to it, and I was like, oh, my goodness, he's so... He's my amazing. boy. He's amazing. No, but yeah. Dax, Shep Dax Shepard, he has uh, his podcast, Armchair Expert, and he had John Gottman on it a few weeks ago, and I was like, oh, my God. I love Dax Shepard, and then put my favorite researcher on there, and it's like, golden. Ooh, it was beautiful. Yeah, I'm no. I, I put it on my Facebook, so you can scroll through and yes. you can find it. <laughs> yeah, I've been, like, getting really into podcasts. Like, I, like, have always been into podcasts, but then I kind of felt like I just took a weird, like, maybe four-month break where I only listened to like maybe one or two and then recently I've been like what have I been doing with my life like mm -hmm. podcasts I need podcasts so. all over yes but no yeah. I think anything yeah. written by John Gottman he, I know he just put out a new book called eight dates and I really want to read that because my and my dating world and everything like that I'm like how do I fucking make this work yeah, <laughs> and everything that's awesome. um but him and Dan Siegel they're just like my two lifestyle gurus yeah. <laughs> so I mean there's there's so many amazing people in the field that they, those are definitely some of my favorite people in the field too. Yeah. They're good people. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what about your favorite quote or any words that are resonating with you lately? Oh, um, what is resonating with me? I, I mean, I have my mantra for the year and I just, I, it's a little bit flippant, but it's cute for me because if you know me and my personality, I, yes. I kind of just spout some shit all the time. You're quirky. And I like I'm quirky. That. Like, yeah. Your quirks are like, you're not just going to, you say things not always like, mm -hmm. direct. I don't know. How to no, I, I feel you like know. I'm pretty direct. It's just like you, I'm you pretty, uh, I can be a little bit abrasive maybe, but it's like I am. <laughs> I'm also fun with it. Like I'm, you are so fun. I'm, I'm trying. I'm not trying to be hurtful to anybody ever with any of my words or anything like that. But it's like you, um, you don't get to come and mess up my world. So my mantra for the year is: No one can fuck up my shit but me, nice. because that gives me my personal accountability of like if things aren't going right for me, that's my problem, and I have to take responsibility for that because nobody can do that but me. But also, you can't come into my world. And mess things up for me. I'm not going to allow that. Right. So that's my mantra for the year. And like I said, it's a little abrasive or something like that. But like that is, that is what resonates for me right now. No, so I love that. Mm -hmm. No, that totally makes sense. And yeah, like me knowing you more from a long-term perspective, it's like, I already know like your heart. And I'm like, <laughs> I know she means well whenever you say something. But yeah, yeah. I can see how like. If someone didn't know you, they'd be like... Oh, oh yeah. Cool. Somebody listening to this podcast is going to be like, why did Jenny have this lady on here who's swearing and just, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> calling people out on their shit all the time and everything? And it's like, no, if you know me, like, we'll talk and sit down and have coffee, you know, and... Uh, be good. I'll just be loving love. on you. Yes. All love. All yes. love. All the time. And then there are going to be other people that are like, woo woo, she's just telling it straight. Telling it like it is. You know, <laughs> we needed to hear that today. It's so true. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And then what, the last question is, what's the one question I didn't ask 
or that you see as important, like, for people to get to know you better or ambiguous loss better? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, <laughs> hi, Nora. She's like, she's... You're taking care of my emotional needs she's right now. Us. Yes, you are so sweet. Um, I feel like the thing people need to know about ambiguous loss is probably that, you know, it can happen at any time and in any kind of relationship. It really is the most untangible, abstract um, human experience, really. Like, like I said, death loss, we all get, we all understand it's going to happen and stuff but as long as we exist in relationships with people we're going to experience ambiguous loss and so you know it really is an important thing for all clinicians to look into and see like you know that maybe there hasn't been a lot of research done in several years about it but that's because there maybe doesn't need to be because like what changes about that except for you know the different ways we can experience ambiguous loss like you know whatever like social media becomes like its own point of loss mm -hmm. now you yeah. know and so like as our technology and our world grows we can apply ambiguous loss to all those things but like the treatment of it um doing psychoeducation kind of narrative stuff and everything like that like that doesn't need to change yeah so yeah, if it works it works yeah like don't fix what's not broken in this one so yeah, for sure. And, I, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, like, through time we might be able to add stuff to it. But oh, yeah. But the core of it is, like, I mean, that's what I've found in our field. Mm -hmm. Just there are some core things that mm -hmm. have stood the test of time. They're timeless. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I dig my Whitaker dude. Like, he did some good stuff back in the day. Like, why change it? Yeah. I'm fine. I'm, fi I'm fine. <laughs> I won't beat people up in session, I guess. I won't, like, physically restrain them or anything. But... The idea behind it is all good. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, that's probably a good thing. yeah, yeah. Uh, let me edit that part. We, I won't do all of the things Whitaker did. <laughs> right. And, well, and there could be philosophy where maybe the practice wasn't always great. Yeah, yeah. Well informed, and that's. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's true of any like, yeah. field if you really look into yeah. the, like theoretical field. Yeah, uh, we have ethics now. <laughs> yes, so. which is a good thing. Yeah, we need that. It's good. It's good. So, mm -hmm. Well, cool. Thank you for spending your time with me today and being yeah. willing to talk about this again. Oh, yeah, I'll talk about um, it all day. It's good stuff. And I just, I like being with you as a human. Um, so yeah. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Yay! Yay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, until next time, maybe we'll talk about, I don't know, there's so many things we could talk about, but I'm definitely going to have you back on. Yeah, no, we, we have talked about Enneagram. Yes. Yeah. Enneagram, that would be awesome. I, I just love that shit. That could be a one where we have, like, many different people and different types and stuff. Ooh, that would be oh. fun if we could get all the types in a room, because you're a one, right? I'm a one. I'm a seven. Mm -hmm. So we just need to get all the other numbers. I know. Dan's a four. Jana's a nine. Okay. Joel and Brandon are a six. Mm-hmm. We're calling people out right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> Getting all our buddies in. Oh, I got a two. One of my good friends is a two as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could do that. We might have to plan that way in advance. But yeah, play that, that way in so advance. Fun. Round table, structured conversation. Yes. This is my type one coming in and everything. Yeah. Plan, we need a three to plan this. <laughs> yeah. Or the one. Actually, one or three to plan it. Yeah. Well. Put Don't me and a three to together. It'll be a little bit more like. This might happen in a year or two, but mm -hmm. oh, that'd be so no, fun. I will make that shit happen. Round, we, should, we should make a group on Facebook round table of, of Enneagram all round types. table. <gasps> yes, plans. I like it. I like it. I would love to hear feedback on that if you guys would want to hear that too. But I think that would be really cool. And some of you are probably like, "What the heck is an Enneagram?" And Maybe we, we got to do that first, and then we'll, we'll round talk table. About it. Yeah, we'll introduce it first, and then we'll do a round table. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. this. Cool. Well, until Sweet. next time. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for tuning into this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Please send all of your feedback either to our Yellow Brick Therapy podcast page on Spreaker or on Facebook. You can also find us on iTunes, and we love it if you rate and review us. That way we can get feedback and kind of understand what it is that you guys love and you find helpful and what it is that isn't helpful as well. Also, just wanted to say that 
Soma Recovery has many clinicians that part of what we do is advocacy and education. So if you are interested in learning more about trauma or eating disorders or substance abuse care or any of those different topics, um, we love to go out into the community and talk about it, whether it's at the dentist office or, you know, or your business and to help you understand how you can create a good, emotionally healthy business environment or even a trauma-informed business environment. So let us know if that's something that interests you. We do that completely for free. Um, it's just part of us giving back to the community and the ways that we have been given to ourselves and through our education and experience. So let us know if that's of interest to you. You can reach me directly at Jenny at Soma, S-O-M-A, Wichita, W-I-C-H-I-T-A dot com. And I love hearing from people and getting to know who's listening. And I appreciate any sort of feedback. And if you guys, again, want any resources, let me know. Because even if we don't provide it, I would love to point you in that direction. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. And until next time.